Hey everybody, good afternoon. It's uh, BJ, and welcome back to another lecture of OTBJ. Uh, recently, I've had a lot of people asking me to go over the stages of healing, as well as other deep breathing techniques. Today, we're just going to do a quick video on that. So, let's begin. So, what exactly is the skin? The skin is composed of three layers. One layer is the epidermis layer, second layer is the dermis layer, and the third layer is the deeper subcutaneous tissue. Each layer plays an important role in the overall function of the skin. For example, with the epidermis layer, right, it's the outermost surface of the skin, which shields our body from, you know, different infections, trauma, rapid dehydration, as we're out in the sun. Uh, whereas the dermis layer, which is right underneath the epidermis, it consists of our hair follicles, right, a tough connective tissue, sweat glands and finally our deeper subcutaneous tissue right it consists of our connective tissue as well as our adipose or fat tissue so now let's move on to the stages of healing the first stage is called the inflammatory stage of healing now the inflammatory stage of healing is really just the acute stage right it's the first response to tissue injury and so the inflammatory stage lasts for a few days to maybe up to a week you know, some of the symptoms we'll see with the inflammatory stage is just the pain, the swelling, right? The inflammation as well as discoloration. We might see some red marks or blue marks on the area of our injury. And during this acute stage, right, we're going to see some blood loss. And so for our body to control how much blood we're losing or to prevent any more blood from coming out, we're going to go through a process called vasoconstriction, which essentially just means that we're trying to close up the blood vessels, right? Because constrict means close to prevent any more blood from coming out. And, you know, during this time, our body begins to send specialized cells, which basically means to clean up or break down damaged tissue, fore matter, and bacteria. Then after this, the mast cells within our body releases histamines, uh, which causes our blood vessels to go through a process called vasodilation which basically means to open up the blood vessels which allows essential cells to reach the wound site and to begin the healing process during the inflammatory stage our goal is to just address that pain the swelling right the inflammation and what's important to know is before we can get into the next stage called the proliferation phase we need to make sure that our wound is completely clean so it's free of you know debris bacteria and again that's just a normal and necessary phase of healing so the proliferation phase of healing uh, begins after five days and can occur for about maybe two weeks and again it only begins when the wound area is clean so when we're clean of the ore matter the debris right and the dead tissue at this point right our body starts to repair the open space created by the wound basically forming new connective tissue right we're covering the wound area and there are uh, three primary components of the proliferation phase such as the wound contraction granulation and epithelialization so with the granulation phase basically the tissue builds on itself at this point to fill the whole of the wound right as we can see as our body forms a matrix of connective tissue in the wound bed and during the wound contracture component the specialized cells of the wound bed pull together to just close up the wound and finally with the epithelialization the epithelial cells uh, move to the top of the wound and they just completely cover the wound right and then that'll promote us to go into the next stage of healing called the remodeling or the maturation phase so just know that the maturation stage of healing is also called the remodeling phase. And it occurs uh, for about two weeks after the injury and it can last up to a year or sometimes longer. In our maturation stage or our remodeling phase, we are going to see a breakdown and formation of collagen. And eventually as our wound matures during the remodeling phase, the scar tissue right, that's being formed becomes more elastic, smoother, and our fibers become stronger. And about three to four weeks in, the scar tissue gets about maybe 20% of the original strength. And then eventually as the 
scar finalizes and it matures, it reaches the final tensile strength of 80% of the original skin strength. In school, whenever we talked about factors that affected wound healing, right, we always look at our past medical history. So clients with diabetes or different conditions that affect the rate of wound healing, you know, they just heal at a slower rate, right? Or at a decreased rate than somebody who is considered healthy. Like the older we get, our bodies tend to heal slower as well as our nutrition, right? What we eat. If we're eating a lot of fatty foods and we're not eating healthy, right? We are going to put ourselves at risk for serious conditions down the line. And also what we eat really helps with our immune system, right? Because we need the proper nutrients and minerals from our foods. So if we're not eating properly, we're causing ourselves more harm than good in the future. And, you know, again, circulation, blood supply plays a big role with wound healing, medications, uh, different foreign matter in the wound bed, because the more foreign matter and infection there is in the wound bed, the longer it takes for our bodies to clean it up and promote that wound healing. Because again, we cannot get into that proliferative phase, right? That second stage of healing until our wound bed is clean. And finally, the amount of moisture in and around the wound can play a big role in uh, wound healing. So let's talk about infections. So with wound healing, right, there's always a big chance for uh, infections to occur. And with infections, we can usually tell if there's a lot of pain, there's a foul, pungent odor that comes out, there's a lot of pus, redness and warmth, um, you know, malaise, or you're just not feeling well, and lymphangitic streaking, which is basically like the red streak marks we can see on our skin. And it's usually due to infection. But also remember that as therapists, we can't diagnose the infection. The physician can diagnose an infection. Okay, and so now let's talk about the non-operative wound management techniques we can use during wound healing. So the first debridement process we're going to be talking about is the autolytic debridement. And again, from the name autolytic, you can infer that it means our body is going to use itself to break down the dead tissue, right? Because auto means self. So you can infer autolytic debridement means our body will break down dead tissue by itself. So as therapists, we can facilitate the autolytic debridement by selecting wound dressings such as film or hydrogel dressings, which essentially just hydrate our wounds and keeping our wounds moist. Um, the hy hydrogels are very soothing and can offer some pain relief. And again, the function of using our wound dressings is just to do the following. One, keep the wound moist and maintain our body's natural enzymes. Right, if we can maintain our body's own natural enzymes, it'll break down the dead tissue by itself. And although autolytic debridement can, can take longer than other forms of debridement, uh, this method is very comfortable and mostly effective. So the second phase is called the enzymatic debridement. So enzymatic debridement is also known as a selective debridement as it only uses topical enzymes to break down the dead or necrotic tissues without uh, harming the healthy tissues in the wound area. And so although this method is effective, it's not appropriate for everybody as there might be some clients who are hypersensitive to the enzyme and may experience some discomfort or irritation. Another method we can use is called the sharp debridement. And with the sharp debridement, again, it's just how it sounds. We're going to be using a sharp instrument such as a scalpel to remove the dead tissue from the wound area. But I do want to point out that using sharp debridement is pretty dangerous. Um, and so most clinicians will just defer the sharp debridement to the physician. Because once you cut something, right, you can never uncut it. It stays permanent. It's often tough to distinguish between fat tissue, a tendon, you know, necrotic tissue. But again, you know, defer this to somebody who is more experienced, like a physician. And finally... The last debridement process we're going to talk about is called the mechanical debridement. And in OT school, we always talked about different physical agents and modalities such as whirlpool, or known as hydrotherapy. 
And hydrotherapy is one of the mechanical debridement techniques we can use. So we talked about how enzymatic debridement is a selective debridement tool, but mechanical debridement is non-selective. And what it basically means is that both necrotic or dead tissue and the healthy tissue will be removed during this debridement technique. And so this can disrupt the wound healing process. And mechanical debridement could be painful for our clients and demonstrate slow wound healing. So oftentimes it's not recommended as there are much more effective and comfortable methods to debridge the wounds during the wound healing process. And that concludes our lecture on stages of healing as well as different debridgement techniques we can use during wound care. And again, the PowerPoint will always be on my website, www.otvj.com, as well as on my YouTube channel, OTVJ. Uh, again, if there are more topics you guys want to learn about, please just let me know. Uh, I know some people have reached out to me to go over this, but if you want to go over brachial plexus, we can. We can go over you know, blood of tendon injuries. We can. Please just let me know. Okay. That being said, I will see you guys next week. Thank you.